Good evening and welcome everyone to Slave Food Conversations, where two African-American physicians explore the role of racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in African-American communities, irrespective of income. They discovered that eating a whole food plant-based diet in urban communities is not only possible, but is the key to eliminating health disparities. Dr. Columbus Batiste is an interventional cardiologist in Southern California. And Dr. Batiste is a passionate double board certified interventional cardiologist who has incorporated the power of whole food plant-based diet combined with exercise and stress reduction in his management of patients. Dr. Eric Walsh serves as a medical director for urgent care services. Dr. Walsh has a double doctorate in medicine and public health. Dr. Walsh is passionate about educating people on ways to improve their mental, physical, and spiritual health. As a result, he's taken his God-given talent across the world and has given lectures and sermons on every continent. April is Minority Health Awareness Month, and every April we observe National Minority Health Month to raise awareness of the importance of improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities um, in, the, in those populations to reduce health disparities. Today, the doctors will discuss the mission to promote and protect the health of diverse populations through research and communication of science that addresses health disparities and discuss some informative research on the importance of having culturally appropriate providers. Welcome to the show. All right. Hello there, Mr. Nett. Hello. I just changed up my router upstairs. I'm hoping my internet is uh, okay. Let me know if I start freezing or something. <laughs> Come on, you're going to be good. It's been a while, man. It's been a while since we've been on here no. together. Last time we did it, and uh, we were missing you. We were missing you. How have you been? Yeah, I, that, 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 my fault. My, my scheduling errors. We'll be Actually, we'll be together next weekend in California live. Yes. Um, yes. I don't know if we'll do a show, but we'll both be at a, a an in, speaking engagement in Cali. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. You know, it's, it's it's an important, you know, the more and more I hear about, you know, this has been our whole platform has been on health awareness for minorities and for really the country disparities that exist in the country between countries. And so April being stress and minority health awareness, I think, is an important month. And I think it really accentuates everything that we've been about for the past several years in terms of trying to bring deliver information. So. Absolutely. And um, and life is really stressful. I mean, we, you know, we were just talking before we went on air on so many things that are going on. I mean, we have shootings seemingly every week, these mass shootings, yeah. nothing seems to be done about it. Um, it gets you nervous. You know, you, you, you're out and about now, you start thinking, hey, could this happen to me where I'm at now? Um, the, the economy isn't doing the best. Um, yeah. You know, there's just a lot going on. So, this is a this is a good month to reflect on how do you manage stress, um, and how can you do better um, reducing those things, the demands in your life that mm -hmm. cause you stress, and getting the resources we like to talk about to help you manage your stress as well, or to 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 remove stress actually. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's it's just a, it's a constant struggle. It, it really, truly is, you know, with with uh, people as a, at large. But, you know, I was I think I shot you a text message real quick when I was sitting there and I was glancing through like some of just my normal medical stuff that comes through. I get articles, I'll glance and look at the abstracts or whatever else. And I saw this article and I was like, wow. That's deep. That's deep. And so we were just like, we got to do a show on this. We got to come back and hit this and do a show. Um, so let me let's 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 dive into this episode. So this episode, you know, I think is rightfully entitled um, the Flexner Report. The Flexner Effect is really what we're talking about. And so we're going to get into that just a little bit. And so, Eric, you're going to probably have to shift a little bit because I'm, I'm playing around with like the structure stuff to your <laughs> other side. So I'm going to have you swivel, swivel over a little bit. There, there you go. go. There we go. <laughs> we're going to work it like together, him. though. It's like it in the middle. There we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> trying to change it up, do something a little bit different. I think everyone knows who you are. So if your name tags, now, I wasn't sure if I was going to be there. You, I'm not worried there. about it. Their name tags. <laughs> that's not important. Yeah, <laughs> but this here, right here, was something else, and I think it really dives into aspects we haven't really touched on a whole lot, which is is having um, healthcare providers who basically look 
like individuals that they're caring for. And we know that that's in theory not possible across the nation, across the board, because one, there's a shortage to some degree, and two, you're not going to always live in the community where there's going to have that access. But I think this was such an interesting article that was just recently published out of Journal of American Medical Association, a major, major key uh, journal inside the medical community. As you see on April 14th, the Black Representation in Primary Care Physician Workforce in its association with population, mm -hmm. life expectancy, and mortality rates inside the United States. It's like just teasing that out just a little bit, I think is it's it's important. It's important. Did you have a chance to take a look at that? We're gonna go over it today. Yeah. Sorry, my lights going. <laughs> Sorry. In and, in and out. Let me uh slip, slip that on. All right. It's like I'm having strobe lights. <laughs> so <laughs> So so what's key in here is that what they found in this period of time that they were evaluating people is that they actually found that when people, individuals of color, African-Americans, have physicians or healthcare providers that actually look like them, that they found that there was a subtle, subtle increase in their life expectancy. Now, this wasn't marked. This wasn't years and years for this short duration of time that this study was done, but it showed a tendency, a trend towards this increase in longevity and showed a decrease right? In mortality or death rates per 100,000 individuals, which was, once again, a significant data point. You know, it also showed a 1.2 lower disparity, which means that they began to narrow the gap between things like colon cancer, between things like uh, heart disease, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, between black and white all-cause mortality rates. And so when you start to look at the impact of this, not just from a standpoint of these numbers, but the impact we talked about, you talked about economically, we're not doing as well. Yep. And so understanding that we're all so intertwined, every aspect, our health, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And that really came through during the pandemic, right? We saw that. Absolutely. We can't just say, ah, okay, well, they have COVID. I don't have COVID, so I'm good to go. Nah, guess yeah. what? <laughs> it's going to, it's just a domino effect that happens. Yeah. And and one thing I, you know, as, as I looked at the numbers, um, you know, I thought this is this has to be a component of the solution, because I would also imagine that if you added some of the other things we like to talk around about around lifestyle, this may be a synergistic component. Um, so this this, uh, you know, I, I would assume the study has you know, you know this, 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 there's a there's minimal amount of that piece of it. But yeah. that's why this is so powerful, because imagine if it, this works so that it accelerates some of the other things that we've talked about on the show before. And I honestly think that that, you know, that would be a great study to see if that's what happens. Oh, absolutely. And and I think one of the things I think we're going to have to touch on sooner or later throughout today's show is why is there a difference in care when someone looks like you? Why is there a difference in care when someone shares similar uh, uh, upbringing as you or similar commonalities with you in terms of culture and so forth? Should that make a difference? And what why does that make a difference? And, and that's really one of the major questions that, that comes about. Should it not matter? Would And here's, here's the crazy part, right? This show isn't meant to do it. But would something like, and this is going to be a little odd. Some people are not going to like this. Would artificial intelligence negate some of the effects of bias or some of the other things that happens there? And depends so these are the program Depends on who programs the artificial intelligence. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Where they're getting their information from, right? Exactly. There has to be some basic fundamental knowledge exactly. that's coming from somewhere, and that plays a major role. But you know, I think I think you brought up one of the things is so if this is part of the solution, is having more physicians of color is what this article implies, what it suggests as far as in its its conclusion. Why aren't we seeing more more physicians of color? And that's that's really the question. <clears throat> and and I mean, you know, part of this here. You have to step back then and look at how challenging the road to and through medical school actually is. Um, and then you, with that, you got to step back and start really look at um, some of the things that happened earlier in life um, around public schools. Um, I remember, you know, personal story that really upset me. I'd moved from Connecticut to Miami in 10th grade. I was an honors AP student in Connecticut. The the gentleman my guy who was given I was given as my guidance counselor was tight with the football coach and tight with the football team of, of this high school, and he told my mother he wanted me to take below average or average classes, give up my honors and AP classes 
so I could play football. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I jumped up out of my seat. My mother had to grab me because I was so offended. I say that just to say it, some of this is an, ex, you know, you have to put the expectation on our young people that they can do great things. And unfortunately, you know, in that case, if I, I loved playing football. So a year before I would have jumped at his opportunity or two years before when I was a ninth grader. So, you know, there's that part of it that, our, you know, our young people have to be, it has to be modeled and they have to be told that they can do it. And that slows down the pipeline, I believe. And this is, that's why this is such a good slide here. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, my dad got involved with Head Start early on. He used to always kind of say, you know, I kind of was one of the first to kind of get Head Start going in, in California. And looking back through some of his stuff after he passed away, he was actually, you know, he wasn't just messing around with us. He actually was. <laughs> and so and so what Head Start so important is trying to say, can we go upstream? There's a great quote by Desmond Tutu who says, at a certain point, we have to quit pulling people out the river and go upstream and find out why they're falling in. You know, and I use that quote a lot talking, speaking about lifestyle. But the reality of it is it's so applicable here is yeah. that if we don't go back to the fundamental years of pre-K even to kindergarten to elementary and and all the way through the middle school, high school, et cetera. And we're seeing why our, our kids are falling out and we're not producing individuals, uh, persons of color who are physician and physician leaders, that there are. There's holes, there's gaps, there's challenges each and every step along the pathway that's there that allows this dropout to happen. You know? Right. Uh, very, very well said. And it is unfortunate because I know people who their residency, I mean, I've seen people all the way to the end, past medical school, and still they got stymied in residency yeah. from going to their, their specialty of choice. I've seen that with an African-American orthopedist friend of mine. And it was really horrible to watch what he went through. And, you know, and it was it, there was a good bit of prejudice, I believe, based on race in that situation, based on the institution he was at. And, you know, you're right. So they, he never makes it. He never he still never got all the way to the goal he really wanted to make it through. Too, so. Yeah. Well, and, and that lends itself to be being dis, potentially potentially to being disgruntled. Right. So if if the area that I end up working is not the, my desired area then my passion may not fully be there. And then when you look at some of the data that's there, there are there is a quite a bit of data that says that speaks to uh, individuals of color being dismissed from residency programs at a higher rate than other individuals. So in the African Americans and others being dismissed, we also see too as well that the characterization and the assessment of providers um, inside of training can sometimes be based off of subjective personality traits as opposed to objective skills that others are graded on. And so you lend itself to the subjectivity and it, it makes you begin to wonder, or it doesn't make you wonder, I mean, you're starting to see a sequence of events that whether or not it's the structure of the neighborhoods because of there's financial disparities. We talk about the color of law, Richard Rothstein. He, by the way, has come out with another book. I got a message Oh yeah, that. I saw that. He, yeah. I saw him advertising it on LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah, I got to get that. I love this first book, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good, it's good stuff. But that was, <laughs> you know, so redlining. Yeah. One aspect, it talks about the homes, but we understand that the financial wealth of the community plays a role in terms of the educational system. Right. And we understand the noise. We understand the food. We understand all these aspects play a role that that propagate these holes inside the pipeline that lead to an issue. So. So that's that. So, you know, when you look overall, what are we seeing? We're seeing that what up through 2019, 2020 academic year, 7.4 percent of the first year medical students were black. And that's a number that had been stagnant since 1978. That's pretty troubling. That's pretty abysmal that below the percent of the population were quite a bit underrepresented. <laughs> and again, we'll probably touch on it, but and it's even worse in some states than in others. And yes. I know for even Hispanics, just to throw that out there, um, mm -hmm. the gap can be massive. And like California's yes. one of those states where the gap is like, I mean, it's like mass, like 20, you know, the, you know, 3% of the, the health professionals in a given field where Latinos are, you know, 30 something percent of the population. So yeah, these gaps matter as the study shows. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, right. So one of the things that's a challenge for me, and I think that one, we're talking about the ills in the medical community, but I also want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the strides. So understanding that there's challenges in the communication, it lends itself to communication. So even if I speak the same language, do I communicate in terms of understanding your culture? 
but the what other aspect of do I can I even communicate with you effectively? So we have things like the the virtual interpreters that are there with iPads and can be there. It's there not you. the same as as communicating, but <clears throat> there are strides that have taken place that weren't present before that you can actually see and you can see the interaction, the body language, if there's understanding on the part of the the translators and the patients. And so there's a there is there is some movement as it relates to it. But when you look and you imagine, I always tell people, imagine if you know, we were abroad somewhere. And oh, do you speak Spanish? Un poquito. Poquito, yeah. Poquito Espanol as well. All right. So, <laughs> I, I, so am studying on a, I am studying on Duolingo, though. Okay. I'm getting better. I don't learn like five of the <laughs> words. I'm, I'm going to some Spanish speaking countries over the next year. So, I'm, I'm practicing hard. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I usually will ask my patients to teach me a word or two, and I, I'll say some things to them. We go back and forth. But I always say, imagine if I was in the, the midst of an emergency room or having to have surgery in a country where I didn't speak the language. Okay. The amount of stress, the amount of fear and anxiety that would be there would be astronomical. And that that's just, it's too overwhelming. And so this is what our patient population that we're caring for is faced with. And that we were obligated to really try and take care of these individuals in a more of a of, of of a holistic approach. And that's even in communication. That really is. So this is one aspect that's there. You know, so we look at that. What's interesting about this slide, we just saw, let me go back for a second. 7.4% of first year medical students were black. This slide says from studies. 5.7% of U.S. black doc uh, doctors are black. That tells us that there's a dropout. Yeah. That tells that tells us right mm -hmm. there, that speaks to the former slide in terms of the pipeline. That even at a level, once you get to the point of being accepted into medical school, that the dropout rate compared to practicing providers, that you can look statistically that there is a dropout, that it speaks to the shortage and the holes that are present there that we need to do a better job in terms of supporting. So it's it's this is this is troubling to a degree. It's troubling, very much. All right. <clears throat> um, so you know it, it kind of gets to this, and this is me. It's kind of like I love history, and so you know uh, 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 Flexner Flexner effect, and, and so I see a, a, a comment come in, and this is a conversation, so I'm good with this. So is the issue, Dr. Walsh, with retention or recruitment? So I would argue it's it's I mean it's it, the the terminology here is more around the terminology we use at work. Mm -hmm. You re, you recruit and retain. With medical school, it's a little different because you have to have the uh, like the 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 skill set and the, and the drive and the desire all the way through the process. And it is a long, grueling process. There were many times I thought to quit and do something else um, in college and in medical school. Um, but so so it's a little different in that there is, so once in medical school i think that's what, what the question is about there is a bit of a recruitment problem here's here's what's interesting what i learned in medical school is that many of the schools have a set amount of black or brown meaning latino in this case black or latino uh spaces uh, allotted so I didn't ever think of it this way until I saw this in my own, in, in my medical school, it was discussed. I'll say it that way. So they had, a, they had it was 140 something students in the class and there were seats for 12 to 14 black people. Here's why that's relevant. If 25 qualified black people applied, they weren't gonna take 25 of them. So it was a weird, even though people talk about affirmative action and all this, it was a weird thing that like, you could have if you had too many, and we and there were a lot of people qualified could have gone to med school with me that were African American or, or Afro Caribbean or even Afro Latino for that matter, but they didn't get in because the way I understood it, it was like the seats filled up. Um, so is it a, so? There, that's a problem. Is that there's a weird, re, weird reverse side of that, like giving an allotment rather than just letting the people in that could get in, um, and then there is a retention problem. Because oftentimes, some you know, you, you can feel very lonely and out there in in a medical school. Failure is highly frowned upon, um, and if the school doesn't really support, our, we were fortunate. And we had on um, the dermatologist went to school with me. Um, I forget her name now. I see her all the time on LinkedIn. She's awesome. And um, you know, Dr. Mack, they had a minority office, and there was a safe space, like an office we could go into and hang out and and cry about things, and then come back. 
So there is a recruitment problem in that I don't know that there's enough talent. I don't know if there's a lot of those young people have been modeled well enough. And I mean, talent is, did they get the level of education you need to be able to do well on the MCAT and, and have the GPA you need? And then there is a retention problem because there are things about medical school that make it easy to drop out. Um, and sometimes they can be less forgiving to people of color, in my opinion, than sometimes they are for other folk. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll key in on what you mentioned about bottling. I think modeling is so import, important when it talks to role models that are there for people to understand that, guess what, this is possible. But not only just from visually seeing that there are physicians of color or whatever, black, brown, yellow, that are out there, but also being able to tap into a network, having resources of like, okay, this is what you need to look out for. Okay, here's the way that you should go about studying. Okay, here's your tests. Hey, have you considered this area of expertise or that area of expertise or this need? What's your passion? And being able to support and mentor folks along. And I think that there's not that readily, readily exposure. Now, one of the things that I learned over the, the years, and I know you have too as well, you've hired lots of physicians and things like that throughout the years. As I look through, and I'm seeing just the amount, I, before I would see mounds of, of supremely qualified individuals. So how do I choose when I have all these individuals who are extremely uh, qualified? Yeah. I was chatting with like a CT surgeon. And so I said, I said, guess what, Dr. Such and Such? If you told me Columbus, a buddy of mine's son is a great guy. He wants to get in. He's applying for a <laughs> cardiology role. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to prioritize that person because guess what? I have a relationship with you. We have commonality. Exactly. We share and everything else. I said, now the difference is many people of color don't have that avenue for that, that inroad like that. And so, and so that's in part what may eliminate even being considered in many instances um, on top of everything else, because you are looking at just mounds of everyone that look nearly identical. Nowadays, a 4.7 GPA, forget 4.0, they've done volunteer work, they've traveled abroad. How do I choose from someone who's great like that, right? Yeah. It ends up being, hey, is it generational? Did their parents go here? Are they doctors? Do I know this? Do they have a relationship? Is there a recommendation from someone that I know? Um, and so there's there's subtleties that come in that's there. And it's it's not a perfect science. And I think that what ends up happening is we live in these biases inside our our little worlds in which we socially interact with and we feel comfortable. And that's what lends itself to, I think, the progressive disparities that we see. And I'll only add on to say that I've heard somebody break down the lack of coaches, black coaches in the NFL the same way. Yeah. That basically the owners have a circle of people that they are they're comfortable with. And even it may not even be like a uh, consciously uh, intentional but Correct. by default, they pick people that someone says they should trust or someone they've worked with before or, or whatever. So uh, it does work the same way, I believe. Yeah. Mike Tomlin, perfect example. Pittsburgh perfect only was forced to, to interview him, and he's gone to win Super Bowls and have winning seasons, right? I mean, that's right. perfect. And even, and even then, he was, they were talking about threatening his job if he had a oh. <laughs> oh, last yeah. season. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so. He's like the best coach in the NFL by, <laughs> by record, and, he's, and his job is threatened. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So, you know, I think the question is, what is the flexor effect? And so I, 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 I pose that question like that because I think a forgotten man inside of history is really Abra is uh, Flexner. And so one of the things that he did is he actually revolutionized on the good positive side. He revolutionized the health education system. And so we sought to go ahead and forget about all the snake oils and all this and people saying oh, yeah. everything could happen. He said, you know what? We need to have a regimented approach towards this. There needs to be research. There needs to be structured training. And let's try and make sure we normalize things. And so that's why he was brought in. He was an educator. He wasn't a physician, wasn't a scientist, wasn't that his brother was, but he was not um, at all. So he set the framework for this. And so in his report, though, this is where bias comes in. He wrote that the African-American physicians should be trained in hygiene rather than surgery and should primarily serve as sanitarians, right? Whose purpose was protecting whites from the common diseases like tuberculosis. Hmm. He espoused and went on further to say that, that you know, because we're living in close proximity, that, that people of color should only take care of people of color and that their training did not need to be at any high level. And that was to protect those that were, were there. Um, and so there, it's inherently built with some areas of, of concern. 
is what historically we reflect on this. And it's like, wow, this was the structure that lent itself over. They talked about a population base, that percent of population should increase the level of enrollment, but excluded African-Americans from that. So we're mm -hmm. reflecting on the percent of populations and, and our, our presence there. And so in 1923, only 66 medical schools remained after he went ahead and he debunked many of these. And five of the seven existing black medical schools were closed. So that means in 1910, African-Americans comprised 2.5% of the U.S. physicians, which yeah. actually decreased to 2.2% in 2008 before That's rising crazy. to around 5% of the workforce today. That means that right now we're roughly about double what we were in, 2000, in 1910. That's where we're at right now. Yeah. That's that's, hor crazy. that's horrible. That when we look at it here, and and so this is from like my favorite movie of all time, something the Lord made, right? You've seen that movie, haven't you? I don't know. I've seen that. Let me write that down. Oh man, come on with most death about Vivian Thomas. It is the oh, yeah, yeah, most... no, that one. Yeah, that was yeah. Actually really good. I did see that. Yeah, that was uh, that's a good one. So this is Vivian Thomas, right? And so <clears throat> they did extrapolations on things and looking at around that time he was born. After this, in the, like the late 20s, 1930s, he went on to do astronomical work. He could not get into medical school. There were only two African-American medical schools. Part of it was finances. And you imagine the talent, right, from this man who really had a gift that God gave him, an untaught skill that helped develop a surgical technique to correct in a congenital abnormality in a baby's heart that would kill him, called the blue baby syndrome, that he went on himself to kind of develop but he wasn't even given credit during that time. It's called the blaylock talzik procedure based upon the white physicians who were involved. And so when you look at that, he's one of the ones I believe was almost one of the domino effects of the closure of the medical schools. Now life, obviously he still was able to contribute and he saved hundreds of thousands of lives based upon the skill that he was given. Yeah. And so they've done estimates that of the five schools that remained open based on projections, that may have provided additional, um, a 29% increase in the number of graduating African-American physicians in 2019 alone, if this mm -hmm. had happened over the course of years, <clears throat> when we look at that, significant. That's interesting. You know, I, I stumbled on this some time ago, and this is a reflection of kind of like really the disparities and the, the that were embedded in terms of racism. And, and this letter, I'll read it for those out there. It says, Dear Mr. Hood, Acknowledgement is made of your letter of July 30th, enclosing your application for admission to our School of Medicine. I am sorry I must write you that we are not authorized um, to uh, consider for uh, assertion a member of the Negro race. I regret that we cannot uh, help you. Yours truly. It says, P.S. I am returning here with your $5 application fee at this point in time. This is the struggle. That was more overt at that time, but still occurs covertly in this day and age that we see at times. And it's what, as a result, many people were treated less than human if they were refused the right towards education, but also in terms of health care. We, we understand yep. that. But so we talked about this a lot, especially yeah. early on when we ventured down the, the uh, slave food and talking about what we talked about the disparities between those people, what happened to those docs who did make it as who those giants who basically sacrificed themselves? They literally sacrificed themselves from the standpoint of health. That yeah. this study basically showed that if you were African American physician uh, from Meharry compared to Johns Hopkins, you were more likely to have a heart attack. <laughs> the heart attack rate and death rate was much higher from the African American physician. And we talk about this as it relates to normalizing uh, income in education, that there's still is persistent disparities. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that one, it makes a strong case as, as you know, as we get older, especially, you really look at stuff like you realize that that stress thing we talk about all the time, it carries, even when you feel like you've made it, hmm. there's a burden you carry. And it, it doesn't, again, sometimes I say this, it doesn't have to be real. It's just no. that perception. And based on life experiences, you may extrapolate out something that really isn't even there, but it doesn't change the fact that it stresses you. Correct. Um, and, that, and that's, I think that's part of why this, the, this, that study comes out the way it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's powerful. And, and, you know, I mean, I think you, you wonder if 
some of the the activities that took place inside the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and even until probably this day and age now things like eugenics and you look at mississippi appendectomies where individuals were told they were going in for append uh, appendectomy and were actually were taken in to have a hysterectomy you know one of the most famous of whom would be the civil rights leader Fan, Fan, uh, fannie lou hamer right yep. we want to do tremendous work in terms of with civil rights but her she herself was subject to this you know others who this is a this is a horrible I, I don't know how i stumbled on this this uh documentary of this individual um who was a child literally and was given radiation and he recalled the instances of being held down and having a metal cap placed on his head mm -hmm. for experimentation and having the light shudder with the electricity jolts that would, would would flood into him and resulted into a persistent deformity of his skull that revealed portions of his brain all the way and he he lived with that for years obviously um for 80 years just just the the tragedy that's there that you think and then we all are aware of these experiments like tuskegee oh, yeah. and, and these were over things that you you think could there have been some way to mitigate this in part by the increased workforce of of trusted individuals that are there that could help and these things that have built in themselves this this issue of lack of trust and you wonder is trust the, the secret sauce of why there is a level of, of engagement, right? So I mean, I, some of this stuff, you know, the implicit bias. Do you deal with this a lot? Implicit bias, like in your job, Absolutely. in the structure. Absolutely, and and I teach it a lot at the um, university where I'm teaching now. We talk a lot about this, um, and there, there, you know, you know, I think we, this is it's such a it's a real thing. I mean, and I, and I think everyone has some. Everyone I mean, by default. I mean, we all have some. You you look at things and you assume certain things about people. I, I think it'd be you'd be I think people would be lying if they said they didn't. Um, but part of part of why you see I think you see this um, where African American physicians are taking care of African American patients. You see you see the, some of the outcomes we saw earlier that are better. I think in part is because one there's a comfort level with the provider, mm -hmm. right? You 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 you're, you're, you're with a patient who you you kind of share cultures. You, you, you have some shared experiences. The, the provider can sometimes have, you know, you feel more in control of, of you know, kind of, of of the situation from like your side of the, the equation. Mm -hmm. But I think the other, it, so I think there's that piece. And then there's the piece that the, the patient themselves is in a situation where, and I've had patients say this to me, like, man, <laughs> I'm glad I got you, you know? And then they start explaining yeah. it. And just that I think will lead to better outcomes. Just that, man, okay, I can talk to you. I, I think you'll get it. Yeah. And I think because we can't make it so it's always one-to-one, -one, this does have to be taught. There's a, There's got to be a way to disarm. And I saw this myself when I was training. Um, one night I was, in, I was at the University of Miami, and, and one night 14 young black men were shot. Mm. One night I was doing trauma surgery rotation in med school, 14. And wow. I remember some of the comments of some of my the, the white students and white residents about black people and guns and gun violence. And I was like, uh, you know, I've never shot a gun, never been shot mm -hmm. at. You know, I, I, no one in my family up until that point had ever had any experience like that. And I was like, you know, so don't assume that this is this is all of black America, you know. But if I wasn't there to say that, they go through that rotation for a month or two, they're going to leave and be like, this is it. Yeah. So later on, when they're practicing in an emergency room, the way they treat those patients is going to be very different than if they saw them as valuable or if yes. they saw them as 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 you know not hyper violent or anything like that. So there's there's that that double connection, um, and then these implicit biases. Here's what's crazy: I don't think they're all just implicit. Some of them are learned in medical school. As much, oh, kind for of sure. Of that story. Some of it is like taught to you in medical school that there's something actually physically. Uh, different about black people. And and, mm -hmm. that, and I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that's great. I mean, I, I don't want to add too much to it, but I'll just touch on one thing, which is something I love and very interested in this area is you mentioned about belief and believing someone. And I think that that is such a, a key component. You know, we call that placebo. We call the power of the mindset that's there, that there's so many studies that have shown that you can change. I always tell people, what are we comparing 
an active ingredient, an active medication to. We're comparing it to what? We're comparing an active ingredient to to the mind. We call it placebo, an inordinate, right. uh, inorganic substance. It's really the mind. So a therapy has to beat out the mind to be effective. And studies have shown that you can manifest an allergic reaction. You can do all these things. And so having a belief in the provider who believes in you is powerful by itself alone. And I think part of that means you have to spend time. You have to actually want to take love, be, be loving with someone. I'm going to let you take this one while I reconnect my, my light here for a moment. Yeah, so um, I, I'll, I'll just read this quote because I think it, we kind of touched on it, but I think it's really yeah. good. And um, it is ubiquitous. Implicit. Speaking of implicit bias, everyone, including physicians and others, other healthcare professionals, has implicit, also called unconscious biases that affect how they view the world and interact with others. Um, and um, we talked about a second ago, and it is hard, you know. And, and, and I think you have to be careful not to kind of weaponize this in a sense. Correct. But I think in order for, especially in healthcare, but in other other factions of society, you've got to be able to read and say, you know what? Sometimes I do make assumptions about people. Sometimes yeah. I see someone, and this is just where my mind goes. And it's good to check that so that you can consciously, since this is unconscious, you can consciously say, no, let me speak to this person. Let me hear their side of the story. Yes. Let me get to know them as an individual and not judge them. And there are people who, you know, evolutionists who believe, you know, that the reason we kind of blanket view people a certain way is because it was good for survival, right? If you if I saw a bear, and I know what a bear does, every time I see a bear, that's what a bear's going to do. But that's not the way people work, you know? Um, and and, you know, and I, I'm, as someone who believes in, in, a, in, a, in a divine design, I definitely know that the, the, the goal is that to connect with people as individuals. And a good physician is going to do that regardless of what they look like. Yeah. And I want to make that point. Um, a good physician is going to do that. And so it's unfortunate when some people, um, you know, start to believe that it can't be done. It can be done. Having more, one of the reasons having more African-American physicians is so powerful is that day, that night in the, in the, in the trauma surgery suite, I was able to speak up and say, no, this isn't the way it is. Yeah. As you don't, if you don't have enough people of, of different backgrounds in the medical school, the people, as we're learning in medical school, all the way through residency, you're not going to hear from that community on the same side of the table as you are. And that's you why know, it's so important. The reason it's so yeah, important. You have to have algorithm disruptors. That's what you're saying, yep. right? Absolutely. Because if, if we're encased in this algorithm of having people who believe the same way we believe, we're going to still perpetuate those same beliefs. And we don't have algorithm disruptors using that whole social media type issue that's happening right now, right? And to right. interject and say, you know what? Let's fact check this. This isn't everyone. This is an isolated case that we can't make this assumption. Yes, you need to be aware. It's the same thing. When I'm going in, I'm doing a procedure, and we find out that the patient has hepatitis or has HIV. The docs are like, the nurse is like, hey, doc, you want to glove up? I said, no. They're like, what? You, you don't? I said, no. Because guess what? Every patient I'm treating is the same way. I'm using the same precautions exactly. of, of PPE with every single patient. So I don't need to take extra because I'm taking that precaution with every patient. It's the same level of care that's there. And it's a slightly different scenario, but it, it's applicable no, is that, is applicable. that we have to go. So well, that, that's a great, that's such a great analogy because you're right. People see a panic and it's like, but you don't know. The, the truth is you don't know what anybody has. So the fact that you know what this one has shouldn't make you more careful. Cause that means you will lower your guard on the person. Yes. You, and, and which is what happens in medicine. People lower yes. their guard. This, there was a lot of bias, and we'll probably touch on it, around pain. And blacks yes. can tolerate more pain. I was taught. Yes. And so yes. black people got less pain medicine. I mean, and mm -hmm. it caused grief and pain all along. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you, when, you, uh, when you look at this, what does this one say? It says, if the trainer doesn't trust the trainee or the trainee doesn't trust the trainer, no one succeeds. Oh, that's, 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 that's true. true. That's true. That's true. This is an interesting study back about 25 years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, in the eight, late 80s. And essentially, the context was they hired actors to come in and give the same script. They're having chest pain. And they brought in at a major health convention cardiologists to assess based on gender, age, and ethnicity who was likely, who would they say had, was having a heart attack. And what was so interesting and recommend for cardiac catheterization, the invasive procedure. And what they found was, of 
who was less likely to receive the care were African Americans. Were less likely to receive the care, less likely to be believed that they were having a heart attack, um, and women even more so. And so it was it was black women who were the most minimized as it relates to it. And this is a reflection. This is using professional actors, using real physicians, and just getting an assessment. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This speaks to implicit bias when there is the same exact verbiage, same exact labs. Same exact EKG, but just manifested in different individuals. The result, the results that were that that came forth. That's uh, this is one of the most powerful studies that are there. This one is a little bit close to home for me, man. Right here, this one is basically talking about dentists and, and the likelihood for root canals because I just went through a major root canal issue and I suffered with pain. Now I don't want to believe it that this is the reason why I went to two different dentists. And none of them wanted to do a root canal on me. They were saying that maybe I had some trigeminal neuralgia. They said, well, maybe I should go see a neurologist. Uh, and I said, come on, man. I said, that doesn't even make any sense. And so I finally, I, I, I even had to stop doing a procedure. Literally, this was in the past, past month. And so I finally go and see another dentist. And he's like, yeah, you know, I think you do need to have it. The scan and so forth went in. And he was like, yeah, you know, everything was dead in that spot. And he said, this is a, you know, and I started reading on it. Presentation is different. But this here implicit, this, this, I was like, kid out of here. Don't tell me it with root canals. I didn't think it was with root canals. You know, I knew everything else. But I, I did not know this. So that's why I, this is a personal one for me. I had to put this one in here personally. I wake that's up crazy. every, I wake up at least twice, twice a week. Thanking God that I do not have that horrific dental pain that i had during that period of time yeah. so i'm gonna tell you <laughs> that's crazy. Now, this, is the one that, this is the one that you were talking about right this this exam of of med students and so forth that half of white medical students and residents uh in the sample they endorsed the false beliefs about biological differences between black and white patients yeah first and foremost that there's a thicker skin when i mentioned this to a colleague in discussion they said that's true columbus I said, it is not true. They looked at me with a straight face and said, I thought that was true. This is within the past year to an extremely intelligent wow. colleague of mine who gives me no, there's no, there's no, there's nothing that makes me think that there is a racial bone in their body. But, but, but this, is this, this, this is different. This is this is different. This is ignorance. Like, like. An assumption, because if you yeah. went to medical school, there's nowhere that they ever taught you that there were like extra layers of skin in black people. Yes. It's, it's all about melanocytes and melanin. Exactly. And white and people and black people have the exact same number of melanocytes. Yeah. So it's just a matter how much melanin is produced. That's yes, the that's it. And this, so you can imagine as it relates to pain and other <laughs> aspects that are just perpetuated as a result. Uh, this statement here is, is the, the in this particular summary, is it participants who endorse the more false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites, they show racial bias in the accuracy of their treatment recommendations. That's the key, is that what they saw is that people who felt this way, it led to their treatment option, their treatments being different that they rendered. Mm -hmm. Now, here's one of the ones that reminds me of a Seinfeld episode where they got mad about the way that they were typing their information, said, well, let me see what you're putting about me. And we see that black patients are 2.54 times uh, the odds of being described with one or more negative descriptors in the history and physical notes in their electronic medical records. And this is after adjusting for social demographic and health circumstances. We know this stuff, it lends itself non-compliant. So I'm big on this now. I say, how do we call the patient non-compliant or that they, they missed appointments when we offer appointments during baking hours and they can't get off work because they'll, they'll be fired? Exactly. How do we say that it's non-compliant when we didn't discuss with them that the cost of their copay for their medication and give them an opportunity to have an alternative therapy that's more appropriate and fits into their budget and spend time explaining to them before we label them as non-compliant in the medical records? And so I think that these things are serious because what that does as a physician, you introduce more bias. Well, if they don't care, I don't care. Mm. If they don't care, why are they here? And this just perpetuates the problem in terms of disparities that are there. Right. No, yeah. right. It's, it's hard. So they propose answers. Hey, well, let's just go ahead and get more 
docs inside there and, and improve outcomes, diversity in medicine, yeah. and it's helpful. And we see it like the study that showed. We see it leads to increased outcomes. But this is one, this is our last slide. This is the one that I found was most intriguing. And we can kind of wrap up the conversation with this. They said, black patients viewed the doctors in a scripted vignette more positively. So here's the thing. They gave a bunch of different doctors the same script, almost the reverse of the other study. Instead mm -hmm. of giving the patients a script, they gave the doctors the same script. And they told the patients before, you should go for this screening or that screening. And then what they did is then they, when they went in and they spoke with the, the providers at more length, what they found is that they were more receptive to the same uh, recommendation and that was communicated in the same way with a black uh, physician versus a white physician. And they felt mm -hmm. that this was revolving the patient-centered communication, right? And so um, there's power in terms of the way in which we relate to people, the way we express both Absolutely. verbally and non-verbally, you know, our communication. Yeah, that, that one was actually quite interesting. Very, very, very much so. Very much so. Let's, uh, well, welcome there, Mr. Nett. Let me, uh, <laughs> there we go. There All right. Are. Got some questions for you. All so right. one of the questions is how can providers who don't look like the population they're serving better serve the communities that they support? I'll jump in and just say, I think part of it is to recognize what you don't know. So for me, you know, I, you know, I think it's better. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I, you know, obviously we take care of patients from many parts of the world, many different cultures, and I'm humble. You know, I try to be humble enough to ask questions, not make assumptions. Mm -hmm. Ask about uh, different preferences. Um, tell them to you know if you, if you feel like I'm not saying something correctly, or if somehow this seems like you know our, this interaction isn't. Um, you know, as fruitful as you want it to be, stop me and tell me. I give you permission to interject and let me and and give me feedback. Um, a lot of times, it takes a few visits if you're like in primary care, and you can build a more of a rapport by being consistent in listening and letting a person talk. But part of it is to just check, you know, to really check yourself and say, okay, what bias do I have in this situation? You know, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that you're talking through that and 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 you're and you're checking yourself. And I think something that uh, Dr. Batista said is really good is even looking back at your notes and seeing how did you describe the patient, you know, um, and, and did you get any negative feeling as you were addressing and taking care of the patient uh, that you otherwise wouldn't get. So there's a lot of self-reflection and I think you need almost like an accountability partner, honestly. Yeah. You need other people who are from the cult, you know, so if you have patients that are from, you know, Taiwan uh, and you and you have a, a Taiwanese co uh, colleague, I think it's wise to, to bounce things off, say, hey, you know, they're coming in, this is what's going on. Is there anything I, I could do better, anything, you know, and take the time to actually try and get some firsthand information on, on, the, on the culture, not from the internet, but from real people and bring in real people, have great, also always have good language services um, yeah. is one of the major things that you have to be able to do as well. Uh, and I, I'm going to add to that just a bit. And what I would say is one of the things that I think just like stop signs for the most part universal that you'll have crossing a sidewalk is a universal signal uh, that they'll have on, right. on that's there. I think love there's a universal non-verbal communication of love and care and concern that comes across distinctly and uniquely irrespective of the of the the chasm of language and i think when you stop and you're patient when you sit when you look at someone when you give them the the respect and respect with your time i think that goes that that's powerful that's powerful in that moment that's there and that bridges and that immediately in that moment they recognize that you care Right. And then now when there's communication that begins to happen as you're going through an interpreter, perhaps that now you're able to to maybe connect with those individuals and you say things. So, I mean, that that's what I try to start with. And I'll be honest, I'm much more cognizant when I know there's a language barrier. It's almost like this idea when your senses, they say that and I actually have never done any literature review on this. They say that when you're, <laughs> you know, if you're blind or whatever else, the other senses are accentuated and, or deaf and everything. It's like when I know that there is a, a, a language barrier, everything else is intensified with me in terms of my interaction with the patient. You know, my physical, I show, I'm describing and, and going different ways. And, and I try and say something that can connect with them. 
I ask, you know, I'll find out where they're from. I'll ask them about something. I'll say something that I'm familiar with that I may have read or whatever else to the interpreter to try and elicit some level of connection, which is what we do probably with people that we meet for the first time. Oh, okay, Miss Batiste, you look, oh, it's nice to see you. I love your glasses. Those are very nice glasses. Oh, where'd you get those? And you make some connection immediately and then you move on and you right. lose that without the communication at times. Absolutely. Okay, so what is the role of the historical black college and university in preparing students um, for the future of, of the medical fields? I'll jump and start just from the standpoint where well, we just saw that that one of the major ones that were there uh, are Meharry and, and Howard University. And we know that Charles Drew came into place and Morehouse came into place subsequent to that. And now we're actually on the verge of having a couple of additional medical school, black medical yep. schools that are opening I think Morgan up. State. Morgan State, yes, is one yeah. of them. Um, and I believe Xavier, too, as well. Um, Xavier as is, well. Is what, I, is what I understand. And so I think that I would personally, having been a graduate of a HBCU, and we talk about this, and Eric has traveled all over the world and speaks about the power of graduating from the HBCU, is I think that the level of confidence and self-assuredness that was instilled in me going to that school, along with, obviously, spiritual aspects and meeting my wife and everything of that sort are such strong there. They've been such hugely huge issues, right. In my development, they've been the huge issue in my a huge contributor in my development and my confidence literally as a physician, I think without having been there and being one of thousands, I'm not, I, I don't know. I might've been fine. I might not have, I might've struggled a bit more. I might not be where I'm at right now. I only, only God knows if there will be a difference in the course. So that's my opinion on it. And I would say it's, I think it's critical. Um, you know, when I used to talk to some of my uh, Latino colleagues when I lived in California, one of the things I used to say to them is one of the differences between black success in this country and Latino success, especially at the time I was, I was with, you know, a lot of my colleagues and stuff at work were Mexican American, um, is that we had our own schools. This one of the few byproducts of segregation that probably did us any good was that we were forced to have our own schools. Um, and because of that, there was a safe space in a, in, a, in a place where we were really built up. People believed in us. They valued us. The teachers wanted to see us do well. When I left Oakwood, my, our H, the HBCU we all went to and went to the next school. I won't even name it. It was Before I went to the University of Miami, I did one year in between of graduate work. I, it was so different. And I was like, man, you know, it, uh, it was like lonely and ice cold and all the black students kind of just collected together anyway. Um, so... You know, I, I think it is important, um, you know, that there are schools that uh, will take you. And, I, you know, I, I interviewed at, at, at uh, uh, Dartmouth, Brown University, Dartmouth and Brown, two Ivy League schools when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and when I visited the campus um, and one of the things and I was I had no I had no desire to go to Alabama to go to school. I was like, That's never going <laughs> to happen. But I talked to all of the pre-med students mm -hmm. uh, when I went for college days. As a as a junior in high school, and I talk and I talked to the professors, and I realized, wait a minute, this school produces a lot of physicians. Mm -hmm. Later on, I would find. I mean, back then, I don't know if the numbers are still like six in the country or something, um, in producing black doctors. I mean, I don't know if that was a, by percentage or ratio or what, but it was like sixth in the country. And so, I, you know, it, there was a confidence and a safe space. Um, there was a lot of modeling. Um, you know, the, all of those things I think work together. I, I do think on the other side of it, two things have to happen. One, you do need more more Xavier's and Morgan State's opening up their own medical schools. Um, I, I wish our school would, honestly. Um, and then the other piece of it is um, there's also a very important part of it where um, we need more medical schools in general mm -hmm. <laughs> because they just. They, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I don't know on your end of it. You're 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 a very highly specialized uh, physician, uh, Doctor Batiste. So you you know you, but on the on the other level where it's where it's primary care. There's a positive. I mean, there's such a shortage. People come see us in urgent care because they're like, well, it'll take, I call my doctor's office, it's three weeks before I can get an appointment. So you need more doctors in general, and that would produce, but the percentage of those hot medical, new medical schools, in my opinion, would have to also produce more, um, more of a diverse um, uh, popu uh, population of physicians as well. Yeah. And I, well, one thing I can say with my um, affiliation with my, my medical group, our medical school that we have in Southern California within Kaiser Permanente, you know, has 
done phenomenally in terms of their recruitment and retention of African-American male students um, and done a tremendous job with that. And I think that, you know, in terms of that's powerful as it relates to that commitment and doing things and in, in delivering care in a different different approach. And it's not intentional. They just took the best people and gave the opportunities, which is huge. You know, and that that's what I'm, I'm very proud of. And I think even Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest, they have a commitment that they've established in order to a center for uh, for African-American care that's there. That they yeah. just are opening up and they're recruiting right now. So anyone out there who's listening knows someone who lives in the Northwest um, who might want a job within the organization that's there. They're actually looking. You can probably find them on LinkedIn and on other um, recruiting mm-hmm. sites. But that's important. That's powerful. That opportunity and that commitment towards narrowing the gap and eliminating the gap of disparities. That's awesome. We've got the question. Um, thank you for the discussion. What advice would you offer to her son who will graduate next month after studying neuroscience and plans to take a gap year before medical school? So I'll, I'll jump in here. I was on um, the admissions committee and admissions process at Loma Linda University Medical School where um, I was on faculty at one time and did one residency and uh, you know, Dr. Batiste um, did med school there. So just to, just to, as a caveat, but w- one of the main things is to make, I mean, let's just be bare bones. You got to have good grades and you got to have a good MCAT score. Um, I, I don't think that's changed, but okay. something Dr. Batiste said earlier is really important. And that is that there are other aspects to it. So you have to also sometimes have done some research, done some service, you have to show that you're someone who's truly committed and caring. I like that about medical schools now. I think they, they, you know, and it's been since we were we were applying. They really do want to know that you're in it for the right reasons, um, and so that's a good thing to try and show. Uh, but if you're taking a gap year, that time, if you haven't taken the MCAT, or you you know, you got to devote the time, do well on the on the, on the MCAT, um, and and uh, and have a good strategy around where you're going to apply. Have a really good. Um, um, essay that you're going to submit because that does matter. When I used to do it and I had to read them, it mattered. Like what it said actually did matter as to whether or not I've made suggestions for or against that candidate. Um, so you want to have a good essay, but you 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 also um, want to practice the interview. Uh, if you get to that point, uh, know how so key questions that you're going to know how to answer. Um, but the testing is really a big deal, and the grades are really a big deal. Taking a gap here, if you have low grades, you can jump to a post baccalaureate program take more science classes and get your science scores up. And a lot of times the schools will just look at that year because if you do really well there and it's a tough school, they'll know that you can handle medical school. Yeah. One thing I would add to it is if if there's an opportunity for research, even at uh, the level of undergrad, that's always an excellent approach for doing it. And I'd be strategic. So when I was going through, I I knew at a certain point I wanted to do cardiology. That was a passion, desire. I felt I loved it. So I was strategic in that I tried to have mentors who not only could help me, but were also situated as either chiefs of co- division of cardiology or were situated inside the medical school. So, um, so then that way, when I'm getting letters of recommendation, that now I'm getting letters of recommendation from voices that are recognized and matter by making a difference for them to get to know me on a one-on-one basis. That's not always possible. So trying to seek out and get exposure and just people love, what I can tell you is that I love passion. So when someone comes to me and they're passionate and they give follow through, I'm all in. Even if I'm busy, I'm going to go ahead and give them my time because I appreciate I had someone reach out to me not once, but twice, but three times. And I was like, let me speak to this young lady at 630 in the morning because she is wants to talk and she's going to med school. And not that I didn't want to, but you're just busy in life. And so that Mm -hmm. persistence, that tempered persistence combined with passion combined with desire, it can go a long way. All right. So we've got about a minute left. And so we have a couple other questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to those. But the question is, who is ultimately responsible to change the outcomes of the number of minority physicians? Mm. All right. I'm going to jump in and start here. And I think the pipeline, from my perspective, I think that clearly demonstrates it's a collective responsibility in my mind. I think the responsibility starts with educators. It starts with parent teacher association uh, committees. I think the responsibility extends into high school and college the same sort of way. I think the responsibility falls on the shoulders of the likes of Dr. Walsh and Dr. Batiste and any other doctor of color that you can think of. 
we have a greater responsibility than just to practice and go home in our cars and in our home and go back to work. That's why we do what we're doing here. And so our, our responsibility is to mentor, to encourage the next generation to build up. So we're not looking at statistics where we're barely twice the amount of physicians that we were in 1910. So the, the responsibility is at, it's at the table of all of us, I believe. Yeah, I, I echo that. I think it's everybody's responsibility. Um, but I do think overall societally, uh, society has to step back and look at it and say, well, what, what's going on here? Um, because clearly it's not biological. It's not that certain no. people are better or worse at this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to do with uh, the, the environment, how people are being taught, what they're being told. Like I said, I was told to take lower level classes because they assume that I'm, I, as a big black guy, I would have better physical acumen and I would, should lead mm -hmm. to that. And it was mm -hmm. uh, clearly the, the abs absolute opposite of the advice I should have been getting. But how many young black men get that advice and never go on to, to school? Had I listened to him, I wouldn't be a doctor today. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess I guess Miss Danette is out. So, <laughs> <Close. She's right> <laughs> <off>. <laughs> all right, closing closing remarks, man. It's it's good. It's I missed you, man. I missed yeah, you. Well, I missed, it's, I, it's I missed good this being back minutes. on with you. Yeah, and, and we we have, we have to make sure we we keep these up. Um, I, I'm sometimes I'm like sitting on a plane, so I'm like, hey, you 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 slave food. <laughs> so uh, we definitely need to keep doing this. Um, yeah. my final words is just you know, listen, we it, the, the secret sauce of all of this is something you said earlier. It's love. And it's valuing other people, um, and I and I and I want people to understand. I don't I don't think that someone white or Latino or Asian can't take care of a black person. That's, that's not exactly. what we're saying. I think what we are saying though is that the field should reflect the society, and in reflecting that society, there are a lot of advantages to health outcomes. And so we, you know, it is worthwhile to encourage young people of all stripes. Um, especially those that are underrepresented in medicine, to go into medicine, nursing, PA school, NP school, all of those different things, um, because we need providers that are able to to take care of that population. Yeah, and what I'll what I'll add because that was beautiful, and I I think that what I'd add is that I think this is, goes back to the mother who is reflecting on her son who's entering into med who's trying to get into medical school. I think when you're well rounded and you have a holistic approach that that affords you the ability to care about others and ex extend that love, that's going to go a long way. That's going to go a long way when you're practicing. Because I'll tell you, there is something we talk about stress and mental health awareness, that there is an issue as it relates to, as it relates to uh, stress in physicians. And we call it physician burnout. And we call it emotional compassion fatigue. And I'll tell you what the cure for emotional, uh, uh, for physician burnout and compassion fatigue is, giving back giving of yourselves by giving of yourself more and volunteering and living a life of purpose, you actually get filled back in return. And I think that that doesn't just happen overnight. That's something that becomes, that's a scenario that builds over time that you, Eric Walsh wasn't built 10 years ago. Eric Walsh was built decades ago. That's who he's always been. And so this process of developing who you're going to be begins now. That's why the, the quote of, 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 of excellence is what we daily do. Habits are what we daily do, right? I mean, it's, it's built, excellence is what we daily do. It's not, it's not, it's, 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 it's this issue of daily habits that we have to put into place. And so that's what I want to leave folks with um, for those who are out there struggling, who are trying to find some answer to this issue of disparities and of stress for a provider standpoint. And for those who don't have a black physician, you don't have, you know, you need to search and demand love. You deserve love. And that's from your providers Absolutely. as well. So, Absolutely. all right. We look forward to seeing you guys next time. We will be back in May. Guaranteed. Can I get a guarantee on that, Dr. Walsh? Yes, we will be back in May. That's right. That's right. We're going to be back in May. <laughs> the, date, the date it will follow, but we will be back. Yes. Promise you. All right. Yeah. It's so good. You spend your time with us this afternoon. Take yeah, care. Thank you guys. Remember to like and share um, what we're doing out here so we can kind of continue to spread the word. All right. Yes. Take care.